Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Please pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this season that you've given me this way. Yeah. Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar. Let us pray. We are, we could be, people of your life. So we pray for the light of your glorious presence in this season of your appearing, Epiphany. We pray for the light of your wondrous grace as we exhaust our coping capacity. We pray for your gift of newness that will override our weariness. We pray that we may see and know and hear and trust in your good rule. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know if you have ever gone on the Episcopal Church website, not the diocesan website, but the Episcopal Church website, our national church website. Uh, I check it out from time to time. And I found that uh, this time when I look, the website offers a verse from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 on their home page, and since I'm going to preach from Isaiah this morning, I love what it says, that verse says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, which is what Epiphany is all about. That light, of course, is Jesus Christ, and the scripture reference is from Isaiah 60, verse 1, and this is what we are celebrating during the season of Epiphany. The season, of course, celebrates the divine manifestation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, living and dwelling among us. I'll be honest with you, I love Epiphany. It's not as, well, what are the reasons? It's not as much work as Christmas. <laughs> and throughout the season, we get to enjoy the baby Jesus for a while, we get to see him be honored by the wise men and loved up on by farm animals. He gets to know his toddler cousin in the season of Epiphany in this lectionary, his cousin John, who will later baptize him, which is pretty wonderful. <coughs> the baptism comes when they're both adults, and Jesus senses a spirit like a dove descending upon him. How cool is that? During the season of Epiphany, Jesus collects friends and followers who travel with him as they learn and they grow in their own faith. And he learns to love them. Frankly, Epiphany goes by too fast. Part of me wants to linger here, enjoying the light of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ enjoying this season of epiphany. However, there is much more going on than the awesome manifestation of God in the person and life 
of Jesus of Nazareth. We also talk about having an epiphany. You've heard that phrase. I had an epiphany. I had insight. I had a moment. The word epiphany from the ancient Greek refers to an experience of a sudden striking realization. In the case of Jesus, the realization to the early Christians and embraced by the church was that God had literally, has literally come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the season of Epiphany allows us to linger here after Christmas, allows us to be gobsmacked by the Incarnation, by the incredible love and humility of our God, who would be made manifest in a helpless newborn baby, and who would experience humanity Growing up from infant to man, a season to be filled with awe because Jesus has done this for the sake of the world that God so loves. It's a season of awe, a season of love, a season of God who came to us, living, breathing, growing, learning, teaching, praying, calling people to him, and sacrificing all, just to be God with us, with you, with me. But maybe the most important realization we can come to is that we are not allowed to remain here. <coughs> Epiphany is a short season. In fact, we are already marching toward it. This morning, the prophet Isaiah booms out. Announce to my people their rebellion. To the house of Jacob, <coughs> their sins. Day after day, they seek me and delight to know my way. As if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. Boom. Right in the middle of it. Isaiah's prophetic words call the faithful out on their hypocrisy. Because here's what's really going on. In their piety, yes, they are observing the ritual of fasting but they are oppressing their workers. Yes, they are wearing sackcloth and ashes and fasting, but they're quarreling and fighting with each other. Yes, they're fasting, but their sackcloth and ashes cannot cover, cannot cover over their betrayal of the poor who are suffering in misery. Maybe some of you are saying, uh, wait, can't Mary? It's not lit yet. It's not lit yet. Can't we just hang out with the baby Jesus and his grown manhood and his disciples? And can't we just hang out with the rise, shine, for your life has come?
just see the light, be the light. An epiphany is a season that calls us to be the light. Yes, it is a short season. And yet, we heard the announcement that, or we will hear the announcement that Lent begins soon and that Ash Wednesday is almost upon us. In fact, it's about two and a half weeks away. So this morning, we are given a teaching about how to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the <coughs> And if we can, how we can carry that into Lent and all the way to that glorious day we call Easter. It's the heart of the message of Isaiah this morning. God is not calling us to sackcloth and ashes. God is calling us to be the light. Now how shall we do this? How can we be a witness to the world that God's, the world of God's plan? How can we participate in his plan for the redemption of humanity? Well, our Christian belief is that God's plan for redemption was accomplished through whom? Through Jesus. Through the Jesus of Nazareth. Through his life, a baby boy raised to manhood in human circumstances. God's plan for the redemption of humanity was Jesus. Inhabited by God's very self, Jesus lived his human life to fulfill a single purpose, to be God among us. To teach, to preach, to heal, and to convert our lives. To raise up witnesses to Almighty God. So the question for us is how can we be a witness to our beliefs? Well, I think first we need to know what witnessing is not. Isaiah draws a contrast between religious acts of piety. He doesn't judge them. He calls a distinction between religious acts of piety and acts that reflect faith. So, yes, says Isaiah, the people are fasting in their piety. But they're still oppressing their workers. Yes, they are fasting in their piety. But they're quarreling. And they're fighting with each other. And they're fracturing their community. Yes, they're fasting. But their sackcloth and their ashes don't cover their betrayal of the poor who suffer in misery right outside the doors of their synagogue, right outside the doors of their church. So there is a difference between religious practice and living and acting out of your faith. We practice our religion. We'll walk out of these doors later this morning to act on our faith. To illustrate this distinction, here is how faith is divine, defined in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's faith. This distinction suggests that at its most basic, faith is more like a channel of trust between us as humans and God. We trust in God's assurance, given out of love so great that God came and dwelt among us even unto death on a human-made cross. And that trust 
that he came for us connects each one of us, not to our own puny faith, but to God's faithfulness through Jesus Christ. Acts of religious faith are different than acts of religious piety. And that in no way diminishes acts of religious piety. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I love acts of religious piety. I really do. Acts of piety are second nature to me and to you. They are an integral part of our daily prayer lives. And they are being devoutly practiced this very Sunday morning by all of us. We came here to practice acts of piety and to hear the word and to receive the grace of God through our confession, through our absolution, through our participation in the Eucharist. We practice the <coughs> corporate worship, scripture readings, the singing of hymns, the prayers, the absolution, the Eucharist. And there is probably no greater act of piety than the moment we will come to in just a short time when we deign to stand and come up and accept an invitation to come forward before the altar of God and to humbly lift, out, lift up and hold out our hands to receive the the very body and blood of our Savior. But when this service is over, when we are sent forth, when Gary dismisses us from this Eucharist, when we walk out the doors of this holy building, then, then we are called to acts of religious faith. So, here again, the Lord's words spoken to us this morning through the prophet Isaiah. He says, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice. To fast from injustice. To cease injustice. To undo the thongs of the yoke. To let the oppressed go, go free and to break every yoke that imprisons the human spirit and often the human body. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, says Isaiah? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. These aren't prayers. These are actions. And they are actions with consequences. Let's visit the reading again, just a few verses. I won't read it all, I promise. But I want us to hear again these verses. Then says the prophet, your light shall break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up quickly. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday sun. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places. Places in your soul that are thirsty. And your gloom will be like the new day. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose water, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. My favorite verse is the final one in the passage we heard this morning. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. The
the restorer of streets to live in. Isn't that wonderful? A repairer of the breach, a restorer of streets to live in. I would love to be 